Welcome to Two Messianic Jews. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Eric. And today we're going to be talking about the top 12 guidelines for having tough conversations. Now this is a, a list. These guidelines are something that Eric and I developed over having uh, conversations with people over in college and in grad school. And we found that by sticking to these guidelines, the conversations we have are just amazing. They're, they're actually productive. And when we've strayed from this, uh, yeah, it's, it's not been going so well. And absolutely, I fail at this. Um, you know, many times, but what we want to do here is just share with, share this with everyone so that we can all learn and have much better conversations with people who disagree with us, having those tough conversations. Yeah, so first what we want to do is share, like, the foundational principle that we think undergirds the rest of these attitudes that we have found and also learned about through listening to others, um, what really help create these productive conversations. So then after we share that foundational principle, we will discuss what we found to be helpful attitudes to take while listening, and then after those helpful attitudes to take while we speak. Um, but yeah, before we start, I'll be honest in saying I have failed on every single one of these guidelines many times. Uh, my family can certainly attest to that. And, you know, like they're not easy to uphold. Um, in fact, you will likely see us break some, maybe even all, of these guidelines, you know, on this show. But we have found that when we do successfully enact these guidelines, that is when we have our best, most productive conversations. So uh, we thought we would share them with you. So how about, Jonathan, you take it away with uh, the foundational principle? So the foundational principle that we want to see as a guide to, you know, all, all these other principles we're going to share with you is that the goal of the conversation should be a shared pursuit of truth or reconciliation. And that pursuing truth is more important than proving your point. And so if you approach the conversation, um, not, not going into it saying, I'm here to prove that I'm right and you're wrong, but that I want to get closer to the truth, that will result in just an amazing dialogue, which that you would not have gotten otherwise had you not employed that principle. Yeah, I find that when I'm able to adopt this attitude, it really shifts the goal of the conversation or the argument for me. Like it, it really changes what it means to win, quote unquote. A conversation is won when the participants, both participants or everyone speaking, walks away with new wisdom and new knowledge. Absolutely. So aiming for truth rather than merely proving your point is an attitude that really helps that play out. Yeah, and, you know, we, we say this, but we're also knowing that, you know, there's, there's exceptions to this, right? So we've all seen, or at least many of us have seen, public debates where two people with two diametrically opposed positions enter a debate stage in order to defend and argue for a certain position, right? They, they prepare for this debate. They want to adequately represent the side that they're representing, and they may, in that debate, and they will, dig in their heels in order to prove the point that they're trying to make. And that's that's fine, that's good, because that allows the audience to those sitting on either side of the fence of the issue or um, just on the fence itself, they can make up their own mind. If they're, the debate is not for the two debate opponents trying to prove to the other one that they're right, it's supposed to present the best case to the audience. So in, the, in that case, that would be the exception. But uh, that is pretty rare. You know, not many people engage in public debates. We're usually involved in conversations with people, you know, just right there in front of us in our life, even on the Internet, you know, whatever it is you, you're going to be in. But understand that for the vast majority of the time, we're not engaged in that. We're engaged in conversations with people who really want to know what truth is. I want to know what truth is. Um, I know, Eric, you're, we're both about pursuing truth and ho hope you are, too. And I think this is just employing this principle will result in just productive, amazing conversations. For sure. hundred percent. And, and so as we move on, we're, we're about to move on to things, attitudes to take on as we listen, mm -hmm. but you will find this principle really undergirds and is the foundation for everything else we're going to say. So keep that in mind. So the first attitude that I have found to be very helpful while we while I listen is very difficult but again it's really a major key and that is to seek to understand before being understood 
And, you know, that's one that I think, you know, at this point, luckily is commonly heard and said, but is so difficult to put into practice. Yeah. And um, this may come up a little bit early on, but just to comment on it here, a helpful way to do that is just to make sure you know what they mean by their words. Just ask them, what do you mean by this? If they're saying something that you think you may be defining differently. Um, and then what's also helpful is to try your best to repeat what you think they're saying back to them and then ask them, is this what you mean? And if they confirm, then you can move on. If they don't confirm, try again, like really seek to understand before being understood. And that will really help this conversation. For sure. Um, a, lot, a lot of times when you, you don't have a mutual understanding of what, what the other person is saying, what you're saying, um, it just leads to two people talking past each other. And no, no one wants that. So the, the, the fourth one that we're, we're going to go over is be open to the fact that in that conversation, they could be the one with the truth that you didn't have. I think um, uh, Maimonides, um, the, Jew, the Jewish philosopher Maimonides, he, he puts it so well. This is, this is the way he said it. He said, you should listen to the truth, whoever may have said it. You know, it, it doesn't matter who they are. They could be someone who possesses the truth, and you need to be ready to listen to the truth, no matter who have said it. Uh, in fact, clinical psychologist Dr. Jordan Peterson, who articulates a lot of uh, similar rules um, that we're sharing today really well, uh, he says, assume that the person you're listening to knows something that you don't. Oh, yeah. So again, it could be big, it could be small, but listen carefully in order to you know, hear, hear it and attain the truth that you're pursuing. Sure. And don't just try to pay attention to like the little parts that you know they're wrong and you're ready to disprove them. Like you'd rather hear where they're right than where they're wrong <laughs> at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is a really, really key um, attitude. I think that that is really helpful. Absolutely. So then the next one, another attitude to take um, that I think is helpful while, while I listen I try my best to not assume anything about my conversation partner's moral character or intellectual position based on hearsay or stereotypes. Listen to the individual. Mm -hmm. It is nearly guaranteed they do not fully live up to their stereotype. And this has struck me, you know, many times, but something that uh, I'll never forget is me and Jonathan, we were up in Brooklyn and we were invited into the home of an Orthodox rabbi to discuss a bunch of issues uh, with him. And we we visited him, was it two, th two times, three times? Oh, three times. Three times. Twelve hours or something like that. It was, it was Twelve hours. Long time. Yeah. And so, but of course, as I'm going to his house for the first time, I'm trying to, like, predict what he's going to say, you know, which is fine. But like a lot of it, of course, you know, because I've never met him before, is just based off of stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And so with an Orthodox rabbi, you know, I have all these stereotypes about what Orthodox rabbis believe, some of them right, some of them wrong. But again, it all depends on the individual. And that definitely became clear <laughs> by the end of these conversations with this particular rabbi, because he was sharing things that I never would have guessed an Orthodox rabbi yeah. would have shared. And the first thing that he said that struck me in this way was that the Tanakh, it can contradict itself, you know, whether he's right or wrong. It was just like I was not anticipating an Orthodox rabbi to, to share something like that. So that really reminded me not to become entrenched and assume a bunch of stereotypes um, as I'm that I really need to listen to to individuals. Yeah, I, that was I had the same experience there. I mean, like the, there was there was actually two Orthodox Jews in the room. And the other one had the exact opposite view as the one who's saying that contradictions yeah. can be found in, in the Tanakh. But I mean, I even for me, when I was when I was talking, I found out something even I think even crazier coming from an Orthodox yeah. rabbi. I would never expect is when I heard the rabbis say that the giving of the Torah, God giving the Torah could have been a deception. Like we, we that we don't know whether it was or was not a deception. And I, I was just completely taken back. And 
um, if, if that's what an Orthodox Jewish rabbi can, uh, would say, um, I really need to be careful and not just assume the beliefs of the, my, my conversation partner of you know, what, what they're going to say, because I really don't know. Things could come, happen unexpectedly. And the way you find out what people's positions actually are is by asking questions, is by listening to what they have to say. And what you'll find is the, the, productive, the productiveness of the conversation just uh, skyrockets when uh, both parties are understanding each other well. For sure. For sure. All right, what's this next one? Yeah, okay. This, this one's fun. So uh, it's, it's something that I don't think we, we think about a lot, but when we start to think about it, I think it makes a lot of sense. And that's that, okay, just because you could point out that someone is biased, it doesn't mean they're wrong. Everyone has bias, right? So if you're, if you're on a certain, you stand on a certain side of an issue and someone else stands on the, on the polar opposite, by saying they're biased, all that means is that they're a human, right? You also are biased in, the, in that direction. I'm biased in a certain direction, right? If you talk to people who aren't biased, um, you're, you're not talking to people. You're probably talking to animals because <laughs> we're, we're all biased. Um, but another thing is that something I learned in, in, in one of my history classes is that bias can actually be a good thing. I, I think bias actually is a good thing. And the reason I say that is because bias allows you to see things that you may not have seen had you not been biased in that direction. So I think a good example of this is that, you know, something that we're going to talk about in this channel, this is Eric's um, specialty, this is where he studies in school, is understanding Paul within Judaism. And for the past, you know, many, many centuries, Christians reading the New Testament, Christian scholars reading the New Testament, have not seen Paul, the Apostle Paul, as a Torah-observant Jew. But this has only been able to come about when Jewish scholars um, in, the, in the late uh, 20th century, reading, or re reading um, the New Testament, and scholars, Jewish scholars reading the New Testament, have been able to discover, no, really, what I, when I read this, I see Paul as a Torah-observant Jew. And that comes from their bias of being a Jewish scholar, of being a Jew reading the New Testament. It also happens with scholarship on looking at Yeshua. And it's what happens is is these Jewish scholars with a bias of seeing the New Testament in this certain way are able to see things that many Christian scholars have overlooked. And this is benefit. This is greatly benefit. Now you see a lot of even um, Christians accepting uh, the Jewishness of, of Paul and, and Yeshua. Now it's slow, but we're, we're seeing this more and more. And I think the reason for that is because of this amazing thing called bias that bias can actually lead you to see things that you would not have seen had you not been biased in that direction. Remember that your bias also prevents you from seeing other things. Yes. And this is why it's so, so important to not only think for yourself, but to think with other people and to talk to other people because they have these other biases that will cover that will cover your blind spots. And that's another reason why you really want to listen to them and pursue truth with them because they are going to catch things that you miss. But it, it's also important to remember that you don't need to become entrenched in your bias. You know, like my biases have shifted, you know, so on some things a little bit, on some things a lot. But as I am taking in the information and wisdom from other people who, you know, noticed things about certain topics that I'd never thought of before, um, my bias has shifted and changed. And then through that, I've been able to notice new things. Yeah, I think this is a really good principle to keep in mind. People have bias that's not, that's just a reality, doesn't mean they're wrong. And bias can be a good thing, but also we need to recognize our bias. Yeah, yeah, you want to test out your bias every once in a while. For sure. And, um, you know, that's kind of one of the points of this channel is, you know, me and Jonathan, we have conversations all the time where we're exploring new ideas. Um, but, you know, we kind of know we're coming from a lot of the same places. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to put a lot of these ideas out there, not only for people to hear and give us feedback from dramatically different biases, but even people with just slightly different biases within specifically the Messianic movement, because at the end of the day, that's the community, you know, this community is who we want to build up. We want to build up you guys, Messianic Jews, Messianic Gentiles, 
and we know there's a whole lot of diversity of opinions on every issue you can think of within this community. And so as we are exploring these issues, we want to be sure to hear from you. For so sure. this guideline is actually one of the motivations behind the creation of this channel. So the next thing that I think is very helpful um, for me is when I'm listening to somebody is to remind myself and remember that talking is thinking. So let me kind of explain, explain that a little bit. Um, so oftentimes I find myself when I'm having a conversation, a lot of times I am voicing an opinion that I've never actually vocalized before. Mm -hmm. It's just been something that's been think like bouncing around my head for a while and it sounds really good. But then when I actually speak it, I think like, okay, that's off. I don't actually, <laughs> I don't actually believe that now that I'm hearing it out loud. Yeah. And so when I remember my experiences like that and I apply that to the person who I'm speaking to, that really enables me to have an attitude of mercy and grace whenever they're speaking, because it's quite possible that as they're speaking, these aren't like fully formulated views, but this is them doing the next step in thinking, which is trying to articulate it. For sure, for sure. And I think a lot of times, you know, in the world we live in, it's kind of rare that we just sit back and, and think. You know, just like you know, we're constantly, you know, we have the, the Facebook and Internet and phones and, and, the, and the news and all the things that are constantly being fed into us that we just don't a lot of times take a moment to think. And when we do think, um, we think that just sitting there a lot of times could be the answer to sorting out through an issue. But this principle of, you know, talking is thinking is something that we can employ. I mean, I, I just imagine, or I, I remember when, um, you know, I'm walking back home from, from school, you know, I'm, I'm Eric has got Emery, I'm at, I'm at Duke and, you know, we're just catching up and we start talking about some serious issue that we've been studying or I've been thinking about. And I'm talking and I'm just, I'm just there talking for, for a bit. And the thoughts coming out may be totally weird, maybe totally wrong. And then I start and then it hits me and I come to a certain conclusion based on just things I've been saying. And I go, Eric, yeah, thanks. Really appreciate that. And Eric's like, I, I didn't say anything. It's like, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was just there. Um, I, I'm thanking him because, you know, he's there. I'm, I'm there talking and I'm coming to a conclusion based on just thinking out loud. And it's amazing the amount of times that, you know, we've been able to do that. You know, you're, you're talking to me and you come to something I can talk to you, you know, we're coming to these conclusions and it's like, oh, wow. You know, so I'm just saying if we're if that's if that's the kind of um, um, success, you know, having just thinking about an issue, talking through and, and coming to a, a conclusion that's we think is right in the moment or I think is right in the moment. Um, just encourage that we all just kind of pursue this, find someone who you can think with, that you can talk through the issues with. And if it's important to you, I think that that is going to be very productive in helping you sort through a lot of these questions, a lot of these um things that you're trying to wrestle with, uh, have someone there to wrestle them with you, whether it's one person or just a bunch of people. But really on this channel, we're trying to build a community of where we can all be wrestling with this together, thinking out loud. You know, I'm talking out loud, Eric's talking out loud. And um, yeah, just having, just having a lot of fun doing it, pursuing truth all through the process. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is something that most people intuitively understand in the context of like, a friendship you know it's yeah. like being a sounding board for your friend and you know they just want to you know bear all their emotions or just talk about an issue and just be a sounding board like we we all understand that that's a good thing but for some reason it took a very long time until i realized like okay i can apply that to strangers or to people online or to acquaintances or like to other, to people outside of my very close knit like i can apply yeah. the same principle of just like okay like be a soundboard and help them figure out what it is they're trying to say mm -hmm. um rather than just attack whatever miscommunication or or rather than just attack whatever point they're making and then maybe they didn't make it in the best way because this is the first time they're actually vocalizing it um like let's just try to apply that same kind of attitude 
to people who we are having these tough conversations with because we're trying to do more than just, you know, mow them down. Yeah. And I, I think this kind of, this kind of leads into the seventh uh, principle and that's, you know, when we're, when we are having these, these conversations, a lot of times we can have this feeling of uncomfortableness. And the principle is that feeling uncomfortable is often a good sign, right? It's a good sign because it means that there's a weakness in your position. And when there's that your weakness in your position has been exposed, a lot of times you're going to feel uncomfortable. And the benefit of that is that when you apply just the general principle of, of pursuing truth is more important than just proving your point. This is fantastic because it means that you're getting closer to the truth. If there's a problem in your argument, if there's a problem in your position, in your view, then it means you can drop that view and you can get closer to the truth. You know, a lot of times when we're, when we're working out or, um, you know, just weight training or just um, studying for an exam or w whatever it is, you're doing a service project, you're working with your hands, you can, you can get this feeling of being uncomfortable. You know, I'm, I'm sitting there dripping in sweat. I'm sitting there feeling sore. Um, I, I hurt myself, right? But the, f the feeling of being uncomfortable is part of the process of improving. You know, tr trial and error, failing and succeeding. Um, you know, it's just about trying to get closer to the truth. And in a conversation, be willing to feel uncomfortable because you will if you're going to grow. Right. Yeah. And then another part of this is that discomfort can often be an indication of meaning. Like if if there is like some tension in the conversation, some discomfort, then that could be an indication that you're having a meaningful discussion. Like you're testing ideas that you've never thought before. Your ideas are being tested in ways they haven't been before. Yeah. And so that's a good sign. Like don't run away from that. Like it's so easy to run away from that, especially when we begin to, when we start feeling that, oh, just because this person's disagreeing with me, even though they're saying it in a kind and gentle way, oh, that means they're judging me, they think less of me. Like it's so easy to interpret this discomfort as something, you know, like judgment. Mm -hmm. But that's not necessarily the case. Like, okay, of course, if you're feeling uncomfortable during a conversation, there's many reasons as to why that could be a sign of something bad is occurring. Yeah. But if you're having just like, an honest conversation with somebody about a topic like you know it's not any of those bad things that discomfort can be an indication of then it could be an indication that you are finding truth you're taking steps towards something that you've never thought about before and this reminds me of something said by dr david rudolph he's a messianic jewish scholar specialist in in paul and first corinthians uh he says in an article called um I think it's healthy guidelines for theological discussion. He says, follow the disturbance. So if you find yourself being bothered in a conversation, ask yourself, why, why are you being bothered? Did they make a good point? Did you realize that you didn't make a good point? Like follow that disturbance because this leads to true thinking and discovery and more complex thoughts and opinions at the end of it. And this is something that, has greatly benefited me this is this is definitely one that i am not always successful i often fail at this one because nobody you know nobody likes being uncomfortable but i find that when i <laughs> when i'm actually courageous enough to follow the disturbance i am always thankful that i did because i discover something either about myself about another person about an idea that greatly benefited the situation um, and my life and my outlook on the world. So I, I really stand by that, that guideline right there. Yeah, that, that's a really good guideline. Follow the disturbance. I mean, just if we just all employed that and we're just like pursuing truth and you know, that, that that's, that's the whole motivating factor. These, di these disturbances are not going to be seen as, as an, as a negative outcome. They're going to be seen as something greatly positive because they're, we're getting closer to what we're trying to accomplish. And, and if you just, you know, take that in life, it's just, it's just fantastic. The opportunities that can come, come your way that would not have come had you not followed the disturbance. So yeah, I really appreciate that from Dr. Rudolph. Absolutely. All right. Yeah, so so what's, the, what's the, what's the eighth principle there? So the eighth guideline, this is the one that I'm trying, that I'm striving for right now. And that is that 
I can passionately hold to an opinion while still listening, understanding, and being open to the contrary. Mm -hmm. Like we're, we're giving all these principles that as you adopt these attitudes, you find that oftentimes it like takes kind of the edge and the negative emotion yeah. out of the conversation, which is a very good thing, but that can also be interpreted. And for some people kind of takes maybe even like all of the emotion <laughs> out of the conversation. And you don't feel like, like, why am I, am I not like experiencing as much conviction as I used to? Like, why mm -hmm. am I not as like fervent about this opinion? It is possible to state your case clearly with confidence and, you know, with passion and emotion, but while still listening, understanding and being open to the contrary and just having that balanced perspective. All right, so then the next principle that, again, I experienced this like full on a few years ago was, is to understand how easy it is to be wrong. Yeah. So I used to be very stubborn, you know, at times I still am, but I used to be very black and white. This is right. This is wrong. My opinion's right whoever I'm talking to, no chance. You have no chance, you know? <laughs> like, Cut this through. is just, this is, yeah, it, it was bad. Um, but then, my senior year of undergrad, I was writing my thesis, and I went through a real dramatic experience on the outside. If you imagine, when you imagine in your head, it's not dramatic, because I'm just reading a bunch of books, but <laughs> a lot of inner drama. <laughs> is taking place um so what i did well i was doing a project on romans 14 a letter written by paul and in this chapter he describes one group as strong one group as weak and you know he he says verses that have commonly been interpreted as like oh he was abolishing kosher law and so i was doing a project where i was exploring you know those issues within that chapter and so one of the things you do when you're doing a thesis project on a topic is you find as many secondary sources, so like sources written by scholars about that same topic. And so on Romans 14, I read, you know, it wasn't even, not even close to all of them, but I read a good bit. I read like 30, 40, maybe close to 50 scholars in their interpretation of Romans 14. And this was really just a profound experience where, you know, I opened up the first one and I'm reading it and I'm like, wow, this is like, this, he's making some really good points. I'm really following what he's saying. Yeah. Like, man, I don't, I don't know how anybody's going to beat this. Like, I think this guy's right. So I put that one down. I take all my notes, pick up the next one. And I'm reading this with like, wow, this guy, he's making some really good points. Like this is, this is really good. Um, this point is different than the other guy's point, but you know, like th these, these can fit. There's a way to make this work, but this guy's making a really good point too. And I pick up the third one and this guy is making a totally incompatible point than the last two guys. And, but again, I'm reading it. I'm like this guy's making some really good points <laughs> and I'm like, but this is totally contrary to the last definitely the first one I'm reading but these guys can't both be right but they're both making like a really strong argument for their mm -hmm. case and you know then I'm at it, then I'm reading another scholar and another one and I've read 20 and I've read 30 and I've read 35 and 40 and by the end of it I'm just like wow I had no idea Romans 14 could be interpreted in that many ways. Yeah, some of them sounded ridiculous and, you know, were very unlikely, but a lot of them, a good portion of them were like, wow, this is compelling, but not all of these can be right. And so I had this moment where I realized, like, okay, if all of these scholars, like the people who dedicate their lives to studying this stuff and have d experienced the most training, they're the most equipped, they're the smartest people, um, some of them are wrong. 
Like they have to be, you know, if there's this many different opinions going on and they're not all compatible. And so once I realized that, I realized, okay, if these scholars can be wrong, how easy it is for me to be wrong. Somebody who hasn't spent 40 years studying a single chapter in Romans, you know, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and what this does is this just created um, a whole lot of what I hope to be humility in me. Of course, that doesn't isn't always on display, but um, ultimately, when I remind myself of this and really feel this, um, I am very, very merciful about hearing the other person. Then also, I'm very careful about sharing what I think and how dogmatic I present it. Yeah, there are things where I do feel very strongly that I think I have it right. But then there's also there's more topics where, you know, I'm not as confident and I say things more carefully and with, you know, qualifiers and and stuff like that. And so I highly recommend that exercise um, to pick a topic, any topic that you're interested in or disinterested in, doesn't matter, and just read all of the opinions and literature, preferably the academic stuff, and just see all of the different opinions out there. And that really gives you an appreciation of just how difficult it is to find truth. And that you realize how much you know, it requires thinking with others and talking and listening and, uh, and understanding with them. Um, and so yeah. by the end of it, when you're doing research on a topic, you should feel, you can feel very, you can still feel very confident mm -hmm. that you have the right view, but there is definitely this foundational humility about it. And this is definitely on display um, when some researchers, they articulated a phenomenon they discovered called the Dunning-Kruger effect. And so what these researchers found is a very interesting correlation between confidence level and the amount of research and time spent mm -hmm. on the development of the opinion um, the amount of research being done on the topic and I'll put a chart up on the screen, but essentially what they found is that people who do a little bit of research, like, you know, they read the Wikipedia page, maybe they read like, you know, the first six hits on Google or maybe even the whole first page of Google. And these people have near certainty, if not total certainty that they know everything that they need to know that their opinion is true and which is so strange. That there's just like, yeah, which is so strange. Um, but essentially what's happening is that when you dip your toe into a topic for the first time and you're reading kind of the broad overview of the topic, you, you get the impression that you like, by the time you read this stuff, all that, you know, is the things that you know. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of get this feeling that, you know everything because you know you feel that satisfaction but then as you see on the chart as you do more a little bit more research especially as you start engaging in the academic literature and reading perspectives of people from a bunch of different perspectives and and biases you'll find that your confidence level and what you believe to be true goes really far down yeah. so like this was me after I read my 40 scholars um, about Romans 14, I'm just in this pit of despair. It's like, okay, it's absolutely impossible to know <laughs> what Romans 14 is actually saying. Um, but then, as you see on the chart, as you power past that, again, follow the disturbance, and you continue to think and talk with others and read and, you know, develop, your confidence level rises 
and um at the end of this chart is where you'll see the confidence level of like of the scholars you know the people who have dedicated their entire lives on these topics you know they get to a place where they have really high confidence in what they believe to be true but you'll find that even them even they weren't as certain as the people who did like a first page of a google search <laughs> so um understanding how easy it is to be wrong gives you a level of humility um and understanding to where it really enables you to be open to what the other person is saying and being open to having your ideas tested and not taking them so personally when the ideas are challenged and that just really revolution it rev that really revolutionized the way i'm able to talk and listen to other people yeah also like when it comes to that just like how research shows you how like you really need to be humble in your answers to like certain questions um th this happened in my first semester in grad school where i mean it also happened in undergrad just studying certain you know my, 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 my thesis or other other research papers but when i took a class on the dead sea scrolls at the end of the course we had our, our last class we had uh, my professor said so tell me what are the what are the things that you've learned from this class what have you what do you want to what are the takeaways that you can walk away saying this is what i've gained from studying these qumran texts and the person who gave probably the, an answer that everyone in the class resonated with was one, one student who said i realize how hard it is to know things about qumran you know like how how difficult it is to um, un understand the answer to a specific question. Like one would be, who who are the producers of the texts? And there's so much debate in Qumran studies that uh, we every week we were reading positions from different of scholars from different different viewpoints. And th this person just said, you know, it's it's just really hard to know. And I think that's true. And I, I think that that adds a level of of humility when I'm approaching other subjects. I'm approaching um, just. Ever, like just subject someone asked me a question what do you think about this and if i literally just saw a facebook post about it i'm just gonna be like i'm i'm, I'm not informed i'm sorry I, I just i can't really comment on that um it, it just forces you to really to to be diligent in your research and to know that you could be wrong and in, in likelihood you, you are wrong in, in a certain aspect of the issue that you're investigating you're, look, you're looking into but um, it's just something it's just something to learn from. I think that if we all yeah, Eric, if we if people engage, if we if we continue to engage in that exercise, um, that that'll change the way we a approach a question. It'll change conversations. And I think for the better. And um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And another thing is that we should also recognize that everyone engaged in a conversation. We they could all be wrong. Right. Like everyone coming to the table we shouldn't assume that even us the, the person you know that, that's engaged in the conversation or the person that you're going to engage with or if there's multiple people in the room right you could all be wrong and the goal should be not for everyone to prove exactly that they are right but the goal should be to get closer to the truth and it's it's an exciting thing and to the point that you know eric you're making about the um the donning kruger effect I think uh, Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson, um, he puts it really well when he says, one of the great challenges in life is knowing enough to think you're right, but not knowing enough to know you're wrong. And that, mm. I think he's right. I think that that really is a challenge. And, you know, a, a large goal of this channel is to know the areas that we're wrong. We're voicing our arguments, we're voicing our opinions. And we want to know, we want to hear from you of where do you think we're wrong? And hopefully as a community, we can grow and get close to the truth and whether it's self-identity, whether it's arguments for um, Yeshua as the Messiah, whether it's issues of Torah, whatever it is, we want to get closer to what the truth of the matter is. And we can do that through a community of engaging with each other and not improving that we're right, uh, not merely just proving we're right, but that we're pursuing truth constantly. And um, yeah, that's, Absolutely. That, that's, that, that's a goal. Absolutely. And I guess I should mention that I'm no, I'm no longer in the pit of despair when it comes to Romans 14. I, I've made my way up the ladder at least a little bit to where like, you know, if I share an answer, it's going to be, you know, with, 
with a good level of confidence. But essentially, when you're in the pit of despair, the reason why it feels like despair is because now you're aware of all that you don't know. So the first page of Google, all you know is what you know. After reading a lot of academic literature, now you know how much you don't know. But then as you follow those disturbances and explore the things that you don't know, you start to learn about them and you do know. And then that's when you start to make that upward trajectory again. All right. What's the next one, Jonathan? Yeah. So this is, this is probably the most difficult one on our guidelines and it's, yeah, it really is. But it's that admitting you're wrong is not a display of weakness, but of courage. So admitting you're wrong is just, it just really, it kind of sucks to do, right? It just, we just, it just, we just feel bad. You know, like there's a lot of, there's, we, we've spent a lot of time on a certain subject, a lot of time studying, or it's just sometimes we own the answer to a certain question so much that it becomes part of our identity and admitting we're wrong is just, it feels like it's an, it's admitting there's a problem with our character, but it, it, it's really, it's not. It's not a problem with your character. It's actually showing that you have good character. It's showing that you're courageous. A lot of people don't do that. But if you're in a conversation and you really do know that you're wrong, the person has shown you that you are wrong and you've done the research knowing that, yeah, they're right. Admitting you're wrong is just going to change the game in the sense that they'll, there's a level of respect that person will have for you. You're respecting yourself enough to pursue truth as opposed to just proving yourself right. Again, the guiding principle. But also, if someone makes a really good point, a really good response to um, an, an argument you're making, that doesn't mean that you are actually wrong, right? You can go home and start thinking about what their, their argument, you can, you can start researching um, more into their perspective. You could start researching and responses to that argument and get closer to what the truth actually is. But when, when you do come to a satis a satisfied answer and you are, a, and your original answer was wrong, admitting you're wrong is a beautiful thing. It's, it's, it's a sign of courage. And, um, another point to make really on this is that if you're in a certain situation and someone gives you an objection, someone gives you an answer and you don't know the answer to, you don't know a response, don't act like you do. If you don't know the answer to a question, don't pretend like you do. And this, this actually happened um, when, again, Eric and I like to um, kind of talk about our, our views on, on certain issues with Orthodox rabbis. And one Orthodox rabbi, we were, we were talking about uh, questions related to the idea, can God manifest himself in human form? And we were making a case from the Tanakh that, you know, God can do that. But the, the rabbi brought up a very powerful passage that seemed to be clear that, that God can't do that. He's not, he's, he not only, he would not do that. And so, uh, in the moment, I really didn't know how to respond. Eric was there with me. He, he, he didn't know how to respond, but we didn't take that opportunity to say, oh, we got to go. I, I know the answer to that question. I know. I just rather, I just, I just really have to go or kind of mix them up on the spot. We, we told them, you know, uh, this is a good objection and I'd like to do more research on this and we can get back and discuss it. And we did, we talked, we did research. We talked to people who, who knew what's up in this area, who've done, who've done their homework and came back and had a lovely conversation, but that would have been prevented had we just pretended like we knew the answer when we actually did it. Now we don't want to give the impression that that doesn't mean you shouldn't like try thinking on your feet and come up with an answer oh, oh, in sure. the moment yeah. to a question that like you never heard before. But when you catch, when you realize that that is what you are in fact doing, it says a lot to say like, Oh, that's a great question. To mm -hmm. be honest, I've never really thought about it. My initial impression and response is this, you know, I'll share it. Let me know what you think, but I'll have to go back and like really think about that. Cause that, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. But you know, just, let's continue this conversation and I'll, I'll share my thoughts, um, for now. And so then that way, like you're just being honest with them, you know, and hopefully that can really just create a space in the conversation where, you know, you can actually get to the things that matter. Again, you're not just trying to prove you're right. You're not just trying to preserve your reputation as a smart person, you know, like you're really getting something greater and bigger than that. 
mm-hmm. and that's the pursuit of truth and oftentimes that requires admitting you're wrong yeah and what I, what I, often happens to me way more often <laughs> than i'm able to actually like say to the person to their face like oh i'm wrong you're right is that you know i get mad you know and everything but i'm still thinking about the conversation like later on that day while i'm like in my room or whatever and it's in that moment where i like am fully able to own the fact and say to myself like okay yeah they are right i was wrong and even that is a big step like for me like i feel myself being shaped in positive ways when I'm doing that and then I'm able to correct my view or have a more nuanced or more complex view. And oftentimes that's what happens. You know, it's, you know, it's not like we're dramatically changing our position every single day, but it could be honing a position. It could be creating more nuance. It could be, you know, understanding that there's some limitations to what you believe or that you have to account for some things that you hadn't thought about. And so again, it's just really part of this greater goal of pursuing truth and having better understanding of the person of the world. And that's an esen- really an essential part of being able to do something like this. And hopefully it's something that we can do on this show. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope that as I share some views that, you know, may be dumb, you know, that I'm able to hear from you guys and come back onto the show and admit to you guys that, oh, yeah, you guys corrected me on this and be grateful for it. Yeah, so that's what, what I'm really hopeful <laughs> that I'm able to do. Um, and that's really what I desire. Like, that's one of the main reasons why we're doing this. Um, How exciting is that? I mean, we got this audience of people, it's this community of people who can just kind of correct us when we, when we make mistakes or where, where, where we're just, you know, not having the right view. I mean, it's kind of limiting when you talk to just one person or two people, but we really have the internet YouTube has allowed us to uh, just test our ideas out and test their ideas out and just kind of get closer to the truth as a community. Yeah. Yeah. So like, even though this channel is, you know, primarily for Messianic Jews and Gentiles and to have, you know, tough conversations within the movement and within the community, we are going to be addressing issues that are relevant to people outside of the community Mm -hmm. and you know i've already seen some subscribers aren't members of the messianic community and even that's still exciting to me because i want to hear from those people because they're bringing another perspective and so yeah everybody please be very active in the comment section if you're watching on youtube Uh, if you're listening to the podcast send us an email at two messianic jews at gmail.com that's t-w-o messianic jews at gmail.com and we really want this to be a conversation um with you guys Mm -hmm. and um we really want to test our ideas out with everybody yeah absolutely um that's that's really why i'm so excited about this channel to hear to to hear from you and to kind of test ideas out with eric and just you know have a good time doing it i mean this this is fun so yeah eric uh, what's what's the 11th um guideline for, for having tough conversations yeah so the 11th one is to state what you believe to be true as precisely as possible. Mm -hmm. This is not only to try your best to articulate what you believe um, for your sake, but it is also so that the person who you're talking to can have a better chance of understanding you and the real ideas that are taking place are being examined. For sure. And so, in other words, the only way to be understood is to be understandable. And, you know, like this will take many attempts and revisions. Remember, talking is thinking, you know, keep trying. Um, but then also with this, this can also be applied not only when you're talking, but when you're listening to somebody, is that realize the reason someone may be misunderstanding your position is not because they're dumb or like they just don't get it. It could be because this happens to me quite often that I'm not communicating what I believe to be true clearly. Like it's my, I'm the, I'm the one, I'm the one holding up the conversation cause I'm poorly communicating my thought. I discover that this often happens when I'm not defining my terms, what I mean, what I'm saying, you know, a specific word or a specific phrase. And once I define those terms, then the other person 
you know, is able to understand what I'm saying and we're able to reach a good point um, in the conversation. So this poor communication, which, you know, is often on, you know, my, <laughs> it's often on my side. My, it's usually me being guilty of it. This is frequently the source of misunderstanding. It's not just because the person who I'm talking to just isn't on my level or, or whatever ridiculous thing like that. All right, so now we'll talk about the last uh, principle, which again, I think is very foundational and undergirds all of the ones that we've shared thus far. Jonathan, why don't you take this one? Absolutely. Yeah, th this is absolutely foundational. It's, it's key to, have, to having great conversations about in tough issues. And that is this, that whenever we are communicating, we need to be communicating what we believe to be true in love. You see, a lot of times, what we were just talking about before, when we're not really trying to understand the other person, when we're, our only point in the conversation is to just to prove that you're right and the other person is wrong, not caring about, not caring about the other person, that is not going to be a productive conversation. Your, your position may be true, but if it's not given in the context of love, if it's not given in love, then it's, it's meaningless. I think the best person to express this principle is the late Dr. Ravi Zacharias. This, this is the way he put it. He says, if truth is not undergirded by love, it makes the possessor of that truth obnoxious and the truth repulsive. Let me repeat that. He says, if truth is not undergirded by love, it makes the possessor of that truth obnoxious and the truth repulsive. Now, I don't want truth to be repulsive to the person I'm talking to. I don't want that. If, if I have the greatest truth they could ever find, or if I just have something that can improve their life, or if something they do not have to be right, but I want to show them what is actually right and true, I don't want them to be, to see that truth as repulsive. I don't want them to be taken aback and saying, I'm, I don't want that. If it's up to me, it, because if it's up to me to show them that, you know, this in a hateful way, if, if, if I'm communicating that truth hatefully, if I'm communicating that truth without love, then it's, it's not going to be re received by that person. And when you, when you do pr communicate truth and love, when that is understood, that's what you're doing. When there's that mutual, when there's that mutual benefit between both, both parties or everyone involved in the conversation, that's when conversations are going to be fantastic and people are going to listen. People are going to learn. You're going to learn. And it's, it's just, it's just amazing. And another point to keep in mind is that we're challenging ideas. We're not challenging people. If an argument is terrible, yes, we need to destroy that argument, but do not destroy the person in the process. You may be destroying the argument, but it's because you love them and uh, you, you care about them enough to tell them the truth. Just some people that like, they're going to get upset. They're going to get offended no matter what you say and no matter how you say it. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I've been in conversations <laughs> where it seems like some people are becoming upset and offended because I am, you know, being gentle and kind while being, you know, reasonable. I've seen that. Yeah. Um, you know, on the flip side, you know, if someone is offended at what you say, you know, don't ignore their offense, you know, maybe, you know, I, as soon as somebody's offended, my first question to myself is like, oh, did I say something wrong? Was I rude? Like, you have to answer that question first. Um, but don't automatically assume that you did do something wrong. You know, like, just because somebody's offended doesn't automatically mean, it could mean, but it doesn't automatically mean that you said something inappropriate or that you said something rude. As I try to live up to these guidelines, it can become incredibly frustrating when it feels like that you're the only one who is trying to operate on these guidelines and principles. And mm -hmm. it seems like everybody who I'm, I've spoken to about these topics are just being real jerks and being, and, you know, they're just trying to prove their point. And I'm over here trying to, you know, pursue truth and being able to admit when I'm wrong but they're making it really difficult to do that. Um, and really, I don't know, Jonathan, you, you may have better advice, but what I have found to be at least effective at times is really just try to lead by example. Um, there was a conversation that I was having uh, in undergrad and it was in like the main lobby of one of the academic buildings. And 
um, an acquaintance of mine came up. He was a member of the atheist club on campus. And, you know, me and Jonathan, we would attend the atheist meetings and we would have conversations with them. And this guy, he had a reputation for being really snarky, really arrogant, really, you know, uh, the know-it-all of, of the group. And that was really on display <laughs> when he spoke. And, um, and it would get frustrating talking to him. Um, but while we were in a bit more of a private one-on-one -on -one setting instead of like at these atheist meetings where it kind of feels, you know, like that whole proving your point thing is like the name of the game. Um, he came up to me and we just had a conversation and he started out, you know, his typical, um, snarky self, but it was a lot easier, you know, not being in the meeting setting for me to actually, you know, live up to these guidelines and, there was noticeable there was a noticeable transition in the middle of our conversation of him being snarky and arrogant to really displaying you know characteristics some of them probably even better than i was of the guidelines that we're talking about and it just resulted in a great conversation and somebody who was sitting next to me who was like over like they were listening to the conversation you know by the time uh, the person I was talking to left this person next to me. They said like, wow, that was like the best conversation I've ever heard. And we were talking about politics, religion, <laughs> like anything controversial you can think of. Um, but he was like, he noticed how I was handling it and he adjusted accordingly and it resulted in a great conversation. So that, that's what I found to be. It's just like as hard as it is, as it is it's often when I fail, even if it seems like, you know, you're the only one upholding these principles. Just try really hard to do so. And hopefully um, the people you're speaking to um, follow suit. It's just fantastic in that, in that setting where, where there's a mutual understanding of what, where, you know, that we're all here because we all want to know what is true. Then it's just, it's wonderful. And uh, I hope we can all employ these principles and uh, keep each other accountable to um, go about these conversations in a way that will result in something that is just um, fantastic and something that would not be otherwise had we not employed these principles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The result of pursuing truth rather than just proving yourself right really leads to conversations. You know, when everybody really locks in on that principle and exemplifies guidelines similar uh, to what we were sharing, um, what the result is, is that you're actually dealing with the issue mm -hmm. at hand, yeah. whether it's, you know, reconciliation or seeking truth on a very complicated political or, or religious topic, like no longer is it a confrontation between two individuals and egos and reputations mm -hmm. are on the line. Like, that's not what it's about anymore. Like, it's no longer about pres preserving um, my reputation. Um, like, we're actually able to state plainly what we believe and why we believe it and hear plainly why the other person disagrees or would, you know, differ slightly or however they would want to respond. Mm -hmm. Like, we're actually producing new thoughts, new wisdom, understanding the other person better and this leads to genuine reconciliation and search for truth absolutely and that's what we've experienced and so that's why we really wanted to share this um with you guys we messianic jews and gentiles should do our best to display these characteristics we're one of the most severely misunderstood groups and if we want to be understood and heard we must treat others and each other like we want to be treated you know, we think that we have fascinating information and compelling arguments for Messianic Judaism to share with you and anybody else who, who wants to listen. But if there is one thing that we hope to produce in ourselves and in you guys and in those who listen to us is the ability to have tough conversations with others. Yeah. Um, we think this is a means to finding reconciliation and peace in an increasingly divided world. So, you know, at the end of the day, 
you may find our channel, our show to be providing information that you love and appreciate and really um, is able to build up your life. But at the same time, if you find yourself disagreeing with us a lot, we want you part of this community just as much as people who agree with us. And so let's engage in these types of conversations. Like let's learn how to have these tough conversations with others and try to come to places of, of peace. Absolutely. And if you want to add or push back on this list, please share with us. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, comment below. If you're listening on the podcast, um, email us at two messianic Jews at gmail.com. That's T W O messianic Jews at gmail.com. And thanks for joining us. And we look forward to hearing from you.